Hey guys, JJ here, back again for another Wednesday of Zoom Networking. The guest speaker that we have today is amazing. Um, a true, true rock star in real estate. Uh, leader in his community, uh, uh, his education community, as well as his city and state. Uh, helps people tremendously in all aspects of real estate. He's at a Pace's Sub 2 community, Pace Morby Sub 2 community. And he's the very first person I spoke to when I got into Sub 2 three years ago. And he took, I couldn't believe how much time he took to help me when I was just a brand new, brand new student. Was thoroughly impressed then, and I've been through impressed the whole way long. And today I'm just honored to call him my friend, my good friend, Mr. Jeremy Davis. Jeremy, how are you, my friend? Doing great, man. You'll uh you'll notice my phone number is not down there anymore. And that's because back then I had the time to have calls like that. And uh now not so much. But uh Anyway, man, yeah, you've been a friend for a long, long time. And let me just really quickly say thank you for doing this. The fact that like clockwork, you have interviewed, you've podcasted so many individuals from the beginning till the end to some really high performers. And so I really love the the the, the foundation that you've built behind this podcast and bringing people together. So thank you very much for that. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Coming from me, that means a lot. You know, it's, sometimes I wonder if people actually know what I'm doing, you know, but, uh, you know, um, recognition is always appreciated and and sometimes it's far and few between, but that's all right. Hey, um, for those that don't know you, where in the country are you located? I'm in Utah. Um, when COVID hit, I evacuated Los Angeles. Um, I ran as fast as I possibly could. I actually used to be in hospitality. Um, if, if I go, actually, you know what, let me go back and back in time, which got me to, to here to Utah. Um, back in the day, um, I've always been an entrepreneur. I've always done things, whether they be legal or illegal. Um, but when I was a, when I was a teenager, um, I actually got arrested when I was 15 years old, giving three seeds of marijuana, like giving three seeds to some friends at lunchtime at the high school that they asked, they're like, we wanna grow pot and do you have any seeds? And I was like, sure. And somebody ratted me out and I ended up getting expelled for giving three seeds of marijuana. Three seeds. And you look at like today, how everyone just laughs at, at weed. Like that was, it was so bad back then. So I ended up getting expelled um, in the very beginning of sophomore year. And I ended up, instead of trying to struggle and fight my way back into high school, I actually just took the chess B test and got out of California high school early. And so from that point on, basically I started being an entrepreneur. Um, I, I, I actually moved, believe it or not, I moved into becoming a medic and I specifically worked in the film industry. I worked in Hollywood. And what got me there was I happened to be uh, at the right place at the wrong time for three different people to die in my arms. Like as I was wow. 16 years old, 19 years old, and I think 21 years old. And so I was like, all these people have died in my arms. I've been the only one to drive CPR on them. And, you know, I've had crowds of people watching them die. So I decided to become a medic. And um, and I worked uh, I worked in the film industry um, for almost close to a decade. And then fast forward to about 2007, 2008. And uh, my roommates, believe it or not, came home with two baby plants. And we're going back to weed, by the way. We're still talking about that. Um, so they come home with two baby plants and they're like, what do we do with these? Like, we don't know how to grow weed. I'm like, you know what? I don't smoke by the way. I, I, I never did really. Yeah. Um, uh, but, uh, I was like, you know what guys, I'm sitting on movie sets for like 18 hour days. And all I'm doing is sitting there waiting for someone to hurt themselves. And all I do is give out band-aids and Tylenol. Like, let me research how to do this. And so I research how to grow weed. And so I end up harvesting the weed and I, and I give it to my roommates and I give it to their friends. And they all say unanimously, this is the best weed they've ever smoked. And so I make the executive decision where I then decide, you know what, guys, I'm kicking you out. I'm sorry, but I'm going to turn my three bedroom apartment into a commercial grow. And so I did that and I ended up like cutting my landlord in on it. And I ended up being um, a commercial grower for a number of the dispensaries. I was I was a contracted name. I helped build a bunch of warehouses. I helped scale something that was two plants into a few hundred thousand plants. And um, and so now 2010 rolls around. I'm riding my motorcycle in the canyons. 
uh, of Malibu and I get hit head on by a Harley. And uh, he crossed the double yellows, hit me head on and sent me 150 feet off the cliff. And I broke my back, my arms, my shoulders. I got airlifted out um, and I got really effed up. I got really, really messed up. And um, so you can imagine that kind of put an end to uh, my cannabis um, career as yeah. well as medic career. And um, and so I, I started recovering. I mean, I was for a few years, I was really, really addicted to painkillers, um, a lot of physical therapy, a lot of surgery. But finally, like 2012 rolls around and it's time for me to buy a house. I'm like, listen, it's it, the the market is now going up. We all look 2012 in the real estate market was when it shot up. That was the base level because we had recovered from the Great Recession and that was the time to do it. And so I ended up trying to go to a couple of realtors and ask them, you know, hey, I want to buy a house. And unanimously, all of them said, you can't buy a house. You have great cash. I mean, literally, I had a lot of cash under my mattress, literally. And um, you got great credit, but you don't have the work history. You've been on disability. You've been recovering from your injury. You can't get a, you can't buy a house. And so like an idiot, one reason I kind of have a little bit of disdain for realtors. If you guys are a realtor in here, I apologize. I don't hate you personally. I just hate your kind. Um, I, uh, I ended up um, taking no for an answer. And I went back to being a server, you know, a restaurant server. Um, what I did in my teenage years and um, thinking that I needed to get a W-2 to do this. Well, the housing market shot up and up and up and up and I can never really catch it. And so I ended up um, doing, uh, being in the restaurant business, being in hospitality, I ended up becoming a sommelier, which just by challenge alone is one of the hardest tests to ever pass. I became a restaurateur. I opened up different restaurants. I became a chef. I was on the show Master Chef. I did a lot of that stuff in the entrepreneurial world. And then COVID hit. And I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I made my way to a restaurant in Los Angeles in Beverly Hills that was probably the pinnacle of all restaurants, Spago, uh, Wolfgang Puck's restaurant. And um, I became the special events director and sommelier there. And um, when COVID hit and everything shut down, I was like, I'm done. I don't, I don't want to do hospitality anymore. The whole reason I went back to being a server was so I can get a W-2 to buy a house. And I've been kind of like finicky, a little bit messing with creative finance, learning about it, understanding it a little bit better. And so when COVID hit, I said, I'm done. Los Angeles, bye-bye. Um, and I moved to Utah. And uh, one reason I moved to Utah was I knew that the housing market was going to be good. Um, but also it is the worst fine dining scene in the nation. There's no wine here. There's no alcohol here. So I kind of like burned the boats behind me intentionally so that I could start a career in real estate. So, so let me get this. Utah's a dry state. It's not dry. It's just Mormon. Very okay. Mormon. Okay. Uh, and so there's a lot of really crazy, weird rules and stuff like that. So, um, but there's, you know, one reason that there's not a lot of good restaurants here is because restaurants typically need alcohol margins to make money so that they can, you know, uh, afford to survive. Yeah. And um, and so by by having these laws be restrictive of the alcohol that they can sell, it means not a lot of talented restaurateurs make their way to Utah, um, which by the way, we're seeing a change now. Now that a lot of Californians and, and West Coasters have moved here, there's been more of a demand now for um, more ethnic restaurants and, and higher end restaurants. So I'm happy to see that. But four years ago, Utah was like, uh, if you Google fine dining or best restaurant, literally McDonald's and Pizza Hut popped up. So um, anyway, so I come here, I have a, a, a under number one desire to get into real estate. And I came here with a lot of cash and I was like, I'm going to do fix and flips. And so I toured somewhere around like 80 or 90 properties. Like literally I walked 80 to 90 properties bidding on them every single time, trying to buy them from wholesalers. And I got outbid every single time. Well, then I finally said, you know what? I want this house. So I bid 120,000 over asking. So they were probably making about 170 to $200,000 off of this deal. And they say, congratulations, you won. Hell yeah, finally. I've been here for like seven months, haven't done a deal yet. Now I get to do my first fix and flip. They call me in the morning and they say, bad news. We decided to sell it to a friend instead. So I go, you know what? 
I'm just going to take my money and become one of your biggest competitors. And that was when I decided to do wholesale. And so in wholesale, it's it's not a business around real estate. It's a business around sales and marketing. And that that was a very long story to kind of segue into where I'm going to talk about in this in this presentation, um, that it's all about sales and marketing. And I could be selling hot dogs. I could be selling houses. I could be selling cars. It really doesn't matter. But what you become is you become a marketing expert. And you coupled with being a marketing expert, you also have to be really good at sales, right? You're not going to get a homeowner to come down on their asking price unless you can sell them on the idea of that being a good decision. Does that make sense? So, yep. uh, so anyway, so, so yeah, that's, uh, you asked me where I where I'm, I live and and I live in Utah. So that was a very long winded. That's why I'm here. So before I continue, do you have any other questions? Well, I, I think you kind of hit him. I was going to ask, you know, what were you doing with your teens into the twenties? But you kind of answered that. You know, uh, I could totally see you in the restaurant business. I could totally see you as a medic. Yeah, I myself worked on film sets for several years. Which, I mean, for me personally, you know, no offense, real estate industry. You know, my seven years on film sets was a highlight of my life. I, mean, I got to work with Cher, Madonna, David Bowie, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, Neil Young, and the list goes on and on. Predominantly music videos, half my stuff. But you talk about working on film sets, brother. I just, um, that's, that's been the love of my life. But It uh, was, you know, working on film sets as a medic in the beginning when I first started, it was a lot of fun. Like, I'm on a movie set. And you've got a lot of amateurs that when it says, don't touch, this is hot. They're like, how hot is it? And they burn themselves, right? When you start to work on the higher end films where all the veterans work, like I was working on all the Marvel, Pirates of the Caribbean, all those. Yeah. Now you're working with more veterans that know not to touch hot things and they're very safe with what they do. So my day was literally 18 hours with maybe giving out a Band-Aid, maybe pulling a splinter. And so it got to a point where the reason I started to do the weed thing I was bored. I was decaying on the inside. You got to Utah. You were learning creative finance, got into wholesaling. Yep. How, and this is a handful of years ago, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, how, how do you, because you and I met through Seb too. Right. How long before you transitioned into that education community? It was pretty quick. Um, I, I had joined a couple of other apprentice programs and a couple of other mentorships that really weren't for me. Um, and, I remember I actually reached out to Pace and I DM'd him on Instagram and I said, hey man, uh, and I was kind of tired of paying for mentorships that really weren't paying off. So instead of just buying into the next you know, community, or actually at the time it wasn't even a community, it was straight up a mentorship. Um, I messaged him and I said, hey Pace, you don't know me, but I'm a very high performer. Um, I would like to document my experience joining sub two from zero to hero. And I promise you that I'm going to, you know, I'm going to pay off. Would you be open to sponsoring me? And his, and he responded and he replied and he says, do you have any idea how many messages like this I get every day? What makes you so special? And uh, I never responded. I never responded. So I just joined sub two and I said, ah, I'll, I'll show you. I'll prove it. Um, so I became a leader in sub two. I ran multiple different regions of, of the country. I built his communication platform, um, that for pretty much the entire, the entirety of it, uh, I think we transacted something like $2.75 billion over that communication platform alone in transactions between students. So, uh, so yeah, I, I, I feel like I did a, a good amount of stuff for the sub two community. I'm really proud of that. Like I really helped a lot of students. And as you said, when you and I first connected, I was just trying to help people, and um, and now I'm here again trying to help people. Yeah, no, very very much appreciated, brother. You're uh, uh, you've been consistent. Thanks. You man. know, as I said before, you're highly respected in the community. Uh, I haven't met a person that has a negative thing to say about you. Just nothing but praise and accolade. I haven't met enough people yet, then. Yeah, well, you know, on the on the flip side of that, I'm sure you and and, and Pace and myself. I mean, anytime you get to a point where you're helping a lot of people. You're always going to have people. You're always the pace that if you don't have haters, you're not doing it right. Yeah, exactly right. Um, so anyway, uh, so yeah, like I said, um, being here, uh, there was one thing I, I failed to mention is that um, partnerships that I had been in and structuring what the wholesale business looked like. Um, I have been in at this point three different rebuilds of my business, and uh, the first one was my own. 
I built it myself. I was the solopreneur. Second one, I came in with a partnership with somebody that turned out to be somewhat of a thief. Um, really did us wrong, did a few different people wrong and, and moved on from that quickly. Then one of my acquisition people that was on my team at that time, I brought on as an equity partner, as, um, uh, as my integrator, as my COO, so to speak. And that kind of went sideways. Um, and so back in September, I made the decision that I was going to scrap everything. I was going to rebuild my business from the very ground up and I was going to document most of it. Um, I had I had realized that, let me give you a little tip real quick. If you see anybody on social media talking about how much they're crushing it in real estate right now, but they have not restructured their business in the past year, they're lying. That when the market shifted, things needed to change in your business. The business that anybody was running in 2020 to 2022 is a different business now just because of the way the numbers are run, the buyers, all that kind of stuff. And so um, I knew that I was watering a lot of weeds. And that term goes into sometimes when you're emotionally attached to things in your business, whether it be a marketing campaign or whether it be a, you know, a television commercial, something, whatever is important to you, may not be paying off, but you have emotional ties to it where you don't want to release that yet. Well, I scrapped it all. I said, I'm done. I literally scrapped all of my software, all of my CRM, all of my everything. And I started over. And so Evan, as you see here in, in, the, in the group, was a sub two student that reached out to me. And I immediately saw a lot of talent coming from him. And so I brought him on as my COO. So together... Evan and I have been rebuilding um, the business that I had originally structured. And with his help, we've got us to a point where, and I'll, I'll give you the spoiler right now, January 1st, we turned the marketing funnel back on. We turned everything back on. And in the first two months, we've generated about 350,000 in revenue. Wow. So, so we're we're kind of going to be at about a 2 million annual for our first uh, first year as this restructured business. Um, and so, and that's because of what I'm about to get into, which is kind of predictive marketing. So, um, yeah, so I, I think that again is, is another segue into where we are now, uh, compared to where I was before and Jeremy Johnson, who just, just commented, Jeremy's in Utah as well. And he's kind of been aware of like what I've been dealing with. And, um, as soon as what our next step is actually is to get into an office. And I promised Jeremy that he's going to do a shadow day with me to kind of see everything that we're doing. So I'm excited for that. And, and thanks, Jeremy. Um, so now to the topic, predictive marketing. Um, it's a it's an umbrella term for predicting what your marketing can accomplish. Okay. And what that means is um, if you knew, if I, if I went to you, JJ, and I was like, hey, JJ, if you could spend $10 to make $20 and it was guaranteed, would you do it? All day. All day. If I said, if you spend $10, you can make $50, would you do it? All day. All day. That is what predictive marketing is. And where a lot of newer investors really fail themselves, like they don't fail, them, fail themselves, they fail themselves on a personal level is because they lack the confidence that they can turn that $10 into $50. And what predictive marketing is, is it is the term that goes into, if you dial in your sales process and you dial in your marketing, you can expect to get an ROI or a return on investment from every dollar spent so that you can scale effectively and you can build a profit and loss tracker so that you can identify your revenue and your expenses and feel comfortable reinvesting that profit back into your business to then scale your expenses. Because for us, we want to spend money. I, it's not that I, you know what, three years ago, four years ago, I was like, I wanna be as cheap as possible. I wanna be on the cheapest CRM. I wanna be on this, 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 cheap, 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 cheap. I wanna save as much money as possible. Not anymore. Now the goal is to spend as much money as possible because we have found that give or take, we have found that return on investment or ROAS, return on ad spend to where we know what we're going to make based off of that. Okay. So, um, so to first do that, to first talk about 
predictive marketing, you got to talk about what type of marketing you're going to do. Um, real quick uh, in the chat, give me a yes if you are currently doing what we call outbound marketing, which is going to be SMS, cold calling. All right, so we got two, so two people. So two people are doing outbound, which is cold calling and SMS, really meaning that you are reaching out to other people, right? Then Jeremy, you just said, just started some direct mail. That is what we call inbound marketing, okay? Which is great. Outbound marketing is examples of cold calling, SMS. I actually own a VA company. Well, technically speaking, I am literally shutting it down right now. Um, that was when I mentioned to you about the watering the weeds. Um, I started a VA company called Prime VAs um, when I first kind of got started doing real estate. I found an opportunity. One of my VAs um, came up to me with the idea of doing it. And I actually, I built out a really great business that we were at the, the high time before the market shifted. I was netting about 40 to 50,000 a month doing a great job. Now, not so much. Things have changed. The marketing's changed. SMS and cold calling are not what it used to be. So uh, for me, it's, um, it's, it's again, watering the weeds. The time that I'm spending on the VA company, I should be spending on more money-making activities within my real estate business. So I'm actually shutting down the VA business. But aside from that, um, you can imagine, I've probably helped thousands of people by this point do deals based off of them being clients of mine. So I can identify how they cold call, how they SMS. And cold calling an SMS is not a bad thing. It's really not. Um, it's the cheapest method to generate leads. A lead through cold calling an SMS can be as low as like $25 to $35. That means that you that person that says, yes, I'm looking at selling, that costs you $25 versus inbound which is uh, you know PPC, Google ads, Facebook ads, um, all those. That could, uh, right now we're spending about six hundred to eight hundred dollars per lead. Okay, so that's where a lot of people get scared. It's a, it's a lot easier to to mess up a twenty five dollar lead than it is to mess up an eight hundred dollar lead. A twenty five dollar lead, you can get the repetitions. You can practice on that. You can. You can mess it up all you want. If you screw that up and that person tells you to F off and go away and never call them again, it only costs you 25. But to get to more inbound leads, which is going to be an example is again, PPC, PPL. PPL is like PPC, but yet you're actually paying another company and you're buying their leads. So it's not your company specifically, it's somebody else's and you're buying them. Um, Go ahead. Do you have something? Yeah, to for we've got probably some new people on the call today, new people watching on on YouTube. Uh, for clarification, what is PPC and PPL? Good question. So PPC is pay per click. That is the term when you're putting ads on Google. Every time that someone on Google types in, "I want to sell my house fast," you guys have all done it. You go on Google and there's those first two or three links that say "sponsored," right? That is PPC. By the way, if you're ever going to ask a question of a company, don't click on their PPC. Don't do it. Okay, because you just cost them a lot of money for something that you could have just gone and scrolled down just a second further and found their non-paid ad and just found their website itself. Um, and that that would have been, um, you know, free for them. So PPC is that. Um then you've got uh, PPL, which is pay per lead, which is you're going to another, um, you'll see Evan here just put uh, a couple of examples of pay per lead companies that you typically put a bidding system and it's almost like an auction that you will buy leads from another company. This is a really good way to get started because you don't have to build out a PPC campaign where, by the way, a PPC campaign is going to be about $10,000 a month. You can be below that, but I really wouldn't recommend it. Um, but PPL is a great way to buy what we call a la carte leads. You could just buy one. Hopefully it converts and you could buy another, right? That kind of thing. So you got PPL, you've got direct mail, you've got SEO. SEO is your website itself. And that stands for search engine optimization, where it doesn't cost you any money if they click on your website, but you do have to spend money to build out the back end of that website. Does that make sense? Okay. So um, so here's the difference, though, when it comes to, again, going back to predictive marketing. 
outbound, meaning SMS and cold call, you're going to be getting a lot more leads to equal one deal. And why is that? Because you're literally calling people and saying, hey, do you have any desire to sell your house? And what is the response going to be? Either no or sure, if the price is right, right? They may not have a lot of motivation. And so we see about an average of, depending on if it's cold calling or SMS, we see about 80 to 120 leads equals one deal. That means 80 to 120 leads equals one deal. If your VA or you are cold calling and getting about two leads a day on average, that's 10 leads a week. That means that you've got to basically have I mean, how many weeks would it would would equal that? Eight weeks to 12 weeks. So it it takes two to three months to generate enough leads to get one deal from outbound. Now let's move into inbound. Like I said, you need a budget of probably about ten thousand dollars a month minimum. Now, not to say everybody has ten thousand dollars a month minimum, and I really, really, really wouldn't recommend spending that money until you have a sales process. And I can, I can probably ask anybody here, if you knew you could spend $10,000 to make $50,000, you would, right? But do you feel confident enough in your sales process that you can convert that? If you're spending $800 for a lead, do you feel confident enough that you're going to be the one, you're going to be the company that tells that that, that person says yes to? knowing that they went to every other website, they went to every other wholesaler, every other cash buyer, and they put in their information as well. Do you feel confident spending $800 on that lead knowing that you may not close it? And that's where the budget really comes into play, okay? So we know that $400 per lead is on the low end, $800 on the high end for inbound. You need a solid follow-up process. You need a solid sales process. You typically have to be an experienced investor. But once you establish that sales process, you now have the opportunity to close, give or take about 12 to 20 leads equals one deal. Okay? So for us, for me, I think I'm at like, Evan, five or six leads equals one deal. Something like that. Um, yes. But the average for most other companies, once they've dialed it in, they're if they're great at their job, it's about 12. If they're mediocre, it's about 20. And if they're eh, it's about 30 to 40. But if you think about it, if you just do simple math and someone's at, you know, $500 a lead and it takes 30 leads to close, what does that just cost you for that deal? 15,000, right? That's right. 15,000. Yeah, 15,000. So that's very expensive. You just paid 15,000 for that deal. And you better hope that you find a buyer for it. You better hope that you got it low enough to where you can make an assignment fee for, for at least the 15,000 to get your money back, if not more. And so inbound is really the next progression for a wholesaler where they can start to trust their sales process and grow it out from there. Okay. So now that we've talked about inbound marketing and outbound marketing, now we talk about predictive marketing. And this is kind of leading into exactly where if you want to build a business, this is where these things need to go. And I'm going to I'm going to share my screen here for just a second. So, here's a couple of examples, guys, of um spreadsheets and charts that we use to identify our income, our revenue, our expenses, and our growth from there. And so if you look at this for example, Q1 uh, 2024, we just, we lowballed it. And like I said, in Q1, we're already at about 350,000. So these are just regular, re like we actually, we created this to share with you guys. Um, so we kind of removed a lot of our personal numbers on this, but revenue being $100,000. What does that mean? That means you have to do $33,000 a month. Is that possible in wholesale? The answer is absolutely that is possible in wholesale. $33,000 is, I mean, for most cities, that's an average assignment fee. So that means you have to do one deal a month to hit $100,000 in revenue. If you spend $27,000 to get that $100,000, would you spend $27,000 to make $100,000? The answer is yes, of course you would. Yeah. 
So you can start to identify that if you if you know what your expenses are going to be and you know what your gross profit is, you can start to scale it and grow it from there. Um, if I go to here, oh, you know, let's go to goals real quick. So this is more of a, a, a more of a simple way of looking at it. If I have a closed revenue goal of, and let's just say this is quarterly, let's say I want to do $40,000 a month. The blue are numbers that you guys get to put in. Okay. This is numbers that you guys get to put in where if your revenue goal is $100,000 a quarter, meaning once again, $33,000 a deal, and you have a 75% success rate, meaning that out of every 10 contracts you get, 7.5 of them go to close. They go to the end. You make your money. Okay. So that means that you would need a projected revenue of $133,000. So meaning you would need four deals a month or sorry, uh, four deals a quarter. So that basically comes out to about 1.3 deals per month with an average deal size of $30,000. Let's say you've got two acquisition managers. This is what you need to do total. Then if you look at this, close revenue for each acquisition manager, $50,000. For the team, it's 100,000. Projected profit, 66,000. Projected profit quarterly, 133. Number of contracts needed, number of contracts for the team, number of offers, that one acquisition manager needs to give out 8.9 offers and your team total of those two acquisition managers need to give out a total of 17.8 offers that equals the deals you're looking for. Does that make sense, guys? Mm -hmm. Same thing goes for monthly, breaking it down monthly and so on and so forth. And so this is where you start to project what your team needs to hit for their goals. Here we have our marketing, okay? Now you'll notice over here, Total contracts, this is one, okay? This is one. What we want to understand and we want to identify is how much it costs of every type of marketing campaign to equal one deal. So for example, if we set a, if we do PPC and we know that our cost per lead is 400 and we know that it takes 20 leads to close one deal and that's leads per contract is 20, that means our cost per contract is $8,000. So we know that we need to set a budget of $8,000 per month to equal one deal. And if we know that our return on investment, if our average deal size is $30,000, that that's what we make on an average assignment fee, and we know that our PPC budget is $8,000 to equal 30,000, then we go all the way over here and we've got our ROI our return on investment. So we know we have a 3.8 X return. We know because we have a dialed in sales process that we have a 3.8 X return. If we look here, what are those fives? Those fives are cold calling and SMS. And why is that? Because our cost per lead is 50 to $75 for, for cold calling and SMS. It's cheaper. You are going to have a higher return on investment off of cold calling and SMS the only problem is you firstly need a lot more leads to get a deal closed because we already identified that it's 80 to 120. But the second reason is, guys, that these leads are not as motivated to sell today. They want to sell six months from now or a year from now. So your cash conversion cycle, the amount of time it takes to get that 5x return takes a lot longer to do. So for me, I'd rather have a 3.8 or a 3.3x any day of the week when it only took me one phone call to close it versus this takes 12 phone calls to close. Does that all make sense, guys? So once you have identified through predictive marketing and you've got your sales process and all that kind of stuff dialed in, it really only becomes a system of math. So even if you're a solopreneur, even if you're a single hustler, but you are consistent at calling your leads and giving offers, this is what you can base your performance off of. You can identify, hey, if I spend $711 on direct mail every month, I can expect a budget um, of $2,133. Cost per lead is 107. Total leads needed is 20. Per month, that's seven leads, leads per contract. And then you give your offers and now you're making a 14.1X return. In other words, 
you spend $2,133 to potentially make $30,000. I'd be okay with that, right? Yeah. So that finally, again, what we go here is we can go, we already talked about this, and then that could even lead into hiring, guys. If you're looking to hire, I mean, raise your hand or say yes in the chat if you would love to hire somebody, but you don't know what you can promise them. I want to see it. I want to see from everybody because I know unless you have something dialed in, I guarantee you that you're scared as hell to try to hire somebody because you're, you don't know what you can promise them. So here right now, income goal, $100,000. This is for the, the hire. This is for the person. If they want to make $100,000 a year, that means they need to make $8,333 a month. That means with a base salary of $2,500, commissions they need to hit per month are only $5,833. Total revenue needed to hit that goal per month is $116,000. What commission do you need to hit? That's 5% commission, guys, based off of a sliding scale. So if they're at 75,000 or less, they're at 5%. If they're at 75 to 100, 7%. 100,000 to 200,000, 9%, so on and so forth. And that does not even include bonuses. And, and so- really quick, just to, just to jump in there, Jeremy, yeah. that's uh, as a follow-up specialist. Oh, yeah, you you're go right. To, you go to that drop down and change it to acquisitions there manager. You go. There you go. Thank you. So just so everybody knows, we pay follow-up specialists 5% acquisitions managers. They are the ones actually closing deals. They get on that tier. And yes. so if any of you guys are wondering why it's $100,000 and they're not in the 7% bracket, it's just because we were. It's it wasn't selected as an acquisition. There team. you go. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, so with that, guys, continuing on here, 7% with their base salary, they need 5833 to hit their 100,000 salary per year. Total revenue needed to hit per month, 83,000. What does that mean? If we already know that our average assignment fee is, well, actually here, I think our average profit, we're showing 40,000. So offers per deal, process offers, blah, 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 blah. So really they only need to do about 2.8 deals per month. 2.8 deals per month, guys. And so offers per deal, we break it down here and we identify that they need 12 leads per contract, cost per lead is this much, and that net cash on cash is for every dollar we spend, we are making a 5.81X on that net. So even when it comes to hiring, predictive data, predictive marketing is extremely important so you can identify what you can promise a team member so that they can hit their goals of revenue so that you can hire effectively and hire the right people. Ideally, the ultimate goal, if you're a sub two student, you don't wanna hire sub two students because hiring a sub two student is probably the worst thing that any business owner could ever do that's in real estate. They're going to leave. They will leave after they learn it. They will learn and go on their own. They wanna work for themselves. Poor retention, spot on guys. Sub two students, they literally join sub two so they can do their own thing. So what they're going to do for you is they're going to literally leech on, they're going to learn what they can, and they're going to go move on and do their own thing. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to build an actual company culture. You're trying to build a career for these people to where they will eventually grow from being a lead specialist, like a follow-up specialist, to being an acquisition, to being a sales manager, to be leading that, and to lead another market, another city to make hundreds of thousands of dollars per year, basically being a salesperson. Because there's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of door knockers out there. There's a lot of solar sale people. There's a lot of sales people that are great at their jobs that have no desire to be an entrepreneur. So this, back to the predictive marketing, this is the way you scale your business. This is the way you predict how to scale your business. You don't do it blindly just going, I'm going to just pick this office and I'm going to pay $10,000 a month and all of a sudden I'm going to make deals happen. So that's that. Wow. I think, I think that's, that's, I'm trying to see if there's anything else to cover. Um, Yeah, no, uh, one thing, one thing I'll add is that um, one of the biggest assets for us was when I decided to scrape everything and start over, um, we actually brought on a coach. 
And while the coach didn't really uh, do any eye-opening, you know, revelations for me where I'm not like, oh my God, I had no idea because I had a lot of SOPs built out already. I had a lot of this stuff built out, but I brought on a coach that provided us a turnkey system to identify these numbers and stuff and, and basically build out our marketing plans and, and hold us accountable for what we did. And so if there's ever, if, if, I mean, I'm not here to sell anything, but if there was anything that I would be promoting right now, if you guys are in this stage, I am extremely happy to pass on your information to them and, and just like have them give you a call because that's all I care about right now is that they really helped. They gave Evan, my COO, who had no experience in real estate. I mean, by argument say none in the wholesale world. They literally handed Evan, my COO, my implementer, my integrator, they handed him the, the box of all the KPIs to track, of all the systems to put in place. And they said, Evan, go and do it. They even told me, by the way, they told me not to hire Evan. And the reason they did is because Evan didn't have wholesale experience. So he had no track record to show me what he would be able to perform. And I told him, F you guys, I, I trust him. And I and so far, Evan has been incredible. And so if you guys, you know, are an integrator yourself, you're a COO yourself, you're an implementer, or you're a visionary and you've got someone on your team that is an integrator and in, is an implementer, something like this is really, really, really important. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll say this. If there, like I said, if there is anybody here that is interested, I'll give you my phone number. And what I'd love is if you guys want to text me your phone, or you're obviously texting me from your phone number, but text me your name and your email. I will very happily pass you on um, and then put you guys in contact if that's something you want. And it's it goes from the low end where they do like a virtual thing for $197 to the high end of $25,000. But I did the 25,000, obviously. Some of you guys probably don't have that money, but if you do, um, this is literally what gave me the confidence to go forward and spend money knowing I will make that money in return. So that's that's my only thing. If you guys want, um, here, let me just, I'll put the number in the chat, but I'll say it, it's, uh, it's 385-488-2889. And let me just type it in real quick. And if you guys want me to put you in touch with the coach, uh, text me the word coach. If you guys don't want that, I'm happy to email you these spreadsheets that we created as well. That'll be free. That'll, that'll be my gift to you guys. Well, I'm going to definitely be texting you just to uh, see what I can find and learn and everything else. Um, Claudia, you're on with Jeremy Davis. What's your question? So uh, two questions. Well, I'm one of those people that he hates. I'm a real estate agent. One of the kind. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I never done a wholesale deal, but this sounds really incredible. But I'm thinking people are having a hard time paying off 6%. They're fighting us. How can you guys make so much money in this deal? Um, Claudia, the simple way to answer that is it's based off of sales. So as I mentioned in the beginning of the call, a wholesale operation is a 50-50 marriage of marketing and sales. I can market all I want. And do you know how many homeowners say to me, I mean, literally I had like three calls today alone that they're like, yeah, I see that Zillow says my house is worth 500,000. I'm not going to take a dollar below that. Okay. If I had no sales experience, if I had no sales talent, I would never get a deal that closes because I'd be like, Sure, that sounds great. Why don't we lock up the contract at 500,000 and I'm never going to find a buyer. And remember, what is wholesaling, guys? And and let me be very clear. I am a buy and hold investor. I am a creative investor, very much a creative investor. We also do rehabs, renovation, fix and flips. We do listings as well, but wholesaling is the term of this deal I don't want in my buy box. I don't want to take this down. It might be the renovations might be too much. I mean, we're literally just a second ago, my contract or my uh, project manager called me. We're doing $120,000 rehab right now on a project. But if that was $150,000, I maybe would say no. And what would I do? I would assign it out. And so again, going back to the sales and marketing aspect to it, 
if you have no sales talent, you're never going to get a deal that closes because you have to be able to approach that homeowner and say, listen, $500,000, that sounds like a great price, but we do know that that's based off of your property being in perfect, perfect condition, right? 2024 standards. Like if you were to be on one of those fix and flip TV shows, your house would be at the after photo, right? So can I ask you, when was the last time you updated your kitchens? Has it been in the past few years? Oh no, it hasn't been in 25 years. Okay, what about your bathrooms? What about the carpet? When was the last time you replaced the carpet? Okay, the roof. When was the last time the roof was repaired? When was the last time the HVAC was replaced? So you're now beginning to have them realize that their house is not worth $500,000. And with marketing, as I said, you're going out and you're reaching out or inbound marketing is the, is the same thing, but you're trying to identify homeowners that are trying to sell their property, not because they're trying to get as much money as possible, but because they're trying to solve a problem. This property that I'm flipping right now, that's $120,000 renovation, we're going to make about $200,000 off this deal. And it's going to take about three months to do that. And why is that? Because this property, I bought it for $145,000. ARV is $500,000. And I bought it because this was a meth head that got arrested and sent to jail. And the house got red tagged because it was condemned because of meth contamination. And nobody was allowed in there. And the homeowner was living in a hotel night to night to night, unable to pay the hotel. And she had no place to go. And I said... I'm not allowed in that house. I can't even inspect it. But if you want me to make an offer, I highly suggest you pay for the meth remediation, get it cleaned out so that I can walk the property and be able to give you a real offer. But if you can't do that or you don't want to do that and you want to sell, it took us six days to close escrow. Six days. And I bought it for 145. Am I making a good deal? Yes, I made a lot, a lot there. But- those don't come by very often. But you know what do come by very often? $10,000 deals, 15,000, 20,000 deals, like little home like little base hits, not home runs. And so Claudia, to go back to your point, you have to have sales experience. You have to have the ability to overcome objections and guide the conversation in the direction that you want to go, which again gets reinforced by the sales process. The script, the way that you communicate with the seller, all of those things go into play to where you, again, feel comfortable knowing if I pay $10,000 on marketing and my sales process is dialed in, then I can make $40,000 from that $10,000. Does that kind of answer your question? It does. Thank you. You're welcome. Graham, you are on with Jeremy Davis. What's your question? My biggest uh, mental, uh, shall we say, uh, mental block on, on this is... Um, um, uh, hiring other people and relying on their skills. Um, and you show us the numbers. And of course, if we put 10 in and get 50 out, we'll do that all day. Right. But that's making the presumption on the skill. So, and when you employ somebody new, I mean, for me, it would be the first time ever. So you've got that um, hurdle to leap. And then you've got the hurdle leaving when when you fire people or what kpis and you know and i'm thinking how much time does all that take you know so how can i get over uh these mental hur hurdles as it were and what expectations or losses can i expect say in the first 12 months click this link on the on the bottom there that right there is a 197 dollar course 197 that literally teaches you scripting. It teaches you overcoming objections. It teaches you what your question was, Graham, about overcoming that fear. You're a gator, right? That's what the that little symbol is. Yeah. Okay. So that tells me that you are a beginner in real estate. You're not even sub two. And I don't mean that as an insult. I mean that like you're you're trying to dive into this right now. Uh, no, I've been 23 years. I did cotton sheets, no money down. I've I've had multi-families over 100 doors. I've been a real estate agent. Wait, well, stop for a second. Stop. How are you? You you've done this much in real estate, but you don't trust yourself talking to sellers. No, no. I How said about scaling been my business, employing other people. Okay. Never done that. Always done it myself. 
Okay. Well, I mean, first step is you have to identify how you speak to sellers, right? Or you speak to agents. Like, how do you lock up these deals? So the first step is going to be identifying your sales skills in particular. And when you hire, I mean, unfortunately, you can't just let them figure it out on their own. You do have to train them. This is a full-time job. Wholesaling is not an easy job by any means. But, you know, in the sub two community, um, sub two and pace, incredible at teaching people how to be closers, how to overcome objections, how to talk about creative finance, how to, you know, give offers and all that kind of stuff. Something that sub two really did lack though, was how to run a business. Mm. How do you, how do you get into an office space and how do you pay those bills and how do you get um, payroll started? How do you get an EIN, all that kind of stuff. And that Graham, I assume you've probably overcome those objections in the past easily. If I said, Hey, can yes. you LLC? Yeah. You'd have no problem, right? Yeah. I've got, I've had an LLC since 2019. So, right. so, so to my point is that to hire and scale first, before you even consider hiring, you need mm -hmm. to consider scaling for yourself first. And all of those numbers I showed you, you'll notice that there was those four different tabs on that spreadsheet. And mm -hmm. only one of them was about hiring. The other three were about identifying your profit and your loss, identifying your revenue, identifying your marketing budget, and identifying how much you need to spend to get X number of deals. So if you are okay spending, let's just do a round number, $10,000 per month, and that $10,000 per month equals 12 leads that you can get in, and you feel confident closing those 12 leads, one out of those 12 is going to be a deal. And you do that, and you repeat that, and you repeat that. And I, like I said, I've done hundreds of deals where I've got no problem training somebody because I've done it so many times. And so if one of my hires says to me, Jeremy, what do I say if they're like, my mom needs to approve of this? Well, I've literally had that conversation many, many times and I know how to train them. So Graham, first identify the numbers in your business. Identify your baseline vitals. Understand what you, sir, what you are able to qualify what you can spend money on and close. So have you talked to a seller before? Yeah. How did you get in touch with that seller? Picking up the phone and dialing them. <laughs> was, it, was it on Zillow? They just had their phone number on a for sale by owner? Or did you? Could be, yeah. I've done it any number of ways every and every different way, you know, so. So would you say that your return on investment on calling a seller that their number was on Zillow was an infinite return? If you locked up a deal and you made money on that by calling for sale by owners on Zillow, mm. did you spend any money calling that? No, not calling. Other than maybe your AT&T or Verizon bill, right? Yeah, I'm my, yeah, I'm my own sure. living. Yeah, yeah. Sure. My own time, yeah. So your return on investment on that is extremely, extremely high, but there's going to come an eventual point where you can't just call Zillow for sale by owners over and over and over again. There's just not enough opportunity to do that many deals. And eventually that's when you have to step out of that seat and have somebody do marketing for you. That's why you hire a virtual assistant. You know, look at uh, Bell. Bell is JJ's personal assistant. And that's because JJ no longer has the time because he's busy with other things. He no longer has the time to send out emails or whatever it may be, whatever Bell does on a daily basis. She's there because now JJ is focusing on more money-making activities that make him more money on his hours spent. A minute of his time is worth more than sending out emails or whatever Bell does. So JJ hires Bell to do that. I hire people to cold call or SMS, or I hire acquisitions people to answer phone calls when somebody gets a letter or a, a postcard from me in the mail. And when that phone number rings and dials in, I want someone there to answer that phone. Hmm. And that's where the next step of scaling comes into play. But where I go, when I go back around to circle this, you need to understand your, your vitals first, your baseline vitals. I know it's a medical term, but like 
your baseline. How many leads does it take for you, Graham, to close a deal? Right? And how much is that deal worth to you? And how much, do, you know, so, so all of these numbers that I showed you, these are average numbers across the market. And I can, I can modify them to show my numbers. So if, for example, in my CRM, my customer relationship management software, in my CRM, if I see that I'm getting a deal for every 400 leads, first of all, I suck at my job. But secondly, I have to identify why are 400 leads only equaling one deal? It's either going to be one of two things. It's either going to be one, I suck at sales. I'm terrible at closing a seller. Yeah. Or two, all of my leads have no motivation. Where imagine if I if I made a website that said, I will pay you more than your house is worth on Zillow. How many people would go to my website? A lot, right? For the chance to sell their house for more than what Zillow's even saying and not have to hire an agent? They, uh, it, it, it'd be dumb for them not to come to my website. So now they come to my website, but how many of them would be willing or wanting to drop their price by another 40%? Probably not many, right? Mm. So that means that I would be getting 400 leads, but not many of them would be willing to drop their price from 500,000 down to 300,000 by one phone call. Mm. So... I would identify that why am I not closing more leads? Is it my sales process or is it my marketing? And you can very easily audit that and identify that. And so Graham, going back to the final question that you asked is how do you overcome this fear and how, how do you overcome this objection? You have to get into it yourself first. Hmm. You have to be able to do that. And you have to be able to track your own performance so that you know when you hire somebody that you can base their performance off of you. Mm. If they do worse than you, you fire them or you train them. You work at better training them. If they're doing better than you, you made a great hire. Yeah. And then the final way to go about this is you don't even have to care about your numbers. You can just JV with somebody and have somebody else that specializes in sales and you don't have to. You can, I see in your, your background, you're a gator, you're a private money lender. Um, something tells me that you've had hundreds of doors you have money. So you could very easily, for example, you could fund the marketing and bring on a sales partner that specializes in sales. And now you don't even have to deal with overcoming that fear. Hmm. But at least you know the numbers. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, and we all have strengths and weaknesses. And it's, you know, if I did scale, it really would be trying to plug the weaknesses, of course, you know. And so it really boils down to what pace teachers, you know, know your avatar and what have you. Um, at the moment, I'm on uh, Shad Nujumi's, uh team. Okay. So, yeah, working there in uh, agent outreach and also um, foreclosures as well. So, so you're making calls right now? You're calling sellers? I'm calling sellers and agents, yeah. yeah okay. On a daily basis, so... Um, and I, I think I've got the skills, you know, I mean, I've closed quite a bit in the past. Um, just right now it's, it's, uh, it's quite difficult finding the motivated sellers, you know, like you said, it's pretty rare at the moment, <laughs> Not even. Rare, but it takes a lot of digging, you know, so. Especially the right now with interest rates where they are. You don't have a lot of people wanting to sell and you also don't have a lot of people wanting to buy. So it's definitely a very hard market. Like, like I said in the beginning of the Zoom, if you did not restructure your business in this past year, you're a liar. Yeah. And so it, that's uh, you have to weigh that risk, you know, and how long it takes to get up and running as well. You know, that's really, could you expect to be up and running and profitable uh, as you laid out within a year or it does it take more than a year, would you say? Um, I've seen some people it, it's again, if they have the widget, if they understand sales and marketing, people can get up and operational in, in three months and be successful. Um, my VA company, I've had many, many clients, many clients that have got their first deals in less than three months because they've come from a sales background. So as soon as they get a lead that comes in, they call it, they lock up those deals. 
There's mm-hmm. also people that have no sales experience. Like my job prior to moving to Utah, like I said, I was a sommelier. It was my job to convince you to spend $25,000 on a bottle of grape juice, mm. right? It's not easy to do that, especially when someone goes into a restaurant only wanting to order a beer. And then now I'm having them spend their you know annual salary on mm. one bottle. So yeah. I came from sales experience. Not many people do, but the people that do come from sales experience, they will be faster at this than that without. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you very much. Sarah. You're very welcome. And by the way, whenever I see PML behind someone's name, uh, I'm always going to ask you, uh, DM me because I'm always borrowing money. Always. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Awesome. Thanks, Graham. Okay, Jeremy. Hardy, you're on Jeremy Davis. What's your question? Hey, Jeremy. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Uh, full transparency, guess, just getting started. So no revamping needed yet. <laughs> but yeah. I do want to thank you because I'm pivoting on my question. My question was exactly how you answered Graham's question is in the beginning, what are you tracking to know what you're best at, what you spend the most time on and what gets you the most results? So I'm assuming those are the things I'm going to be tracking. And then I mean, as I, I gain more. Yeah. I want to interrupt you. I want to interrupt you. So okay. I'll make it so simple for you guys to understand. Okay. In the beginning, here's what you track. You go onto your bank statements, <laughs> you look at how much money you're spending on your marketing. Okay. Mm-hmm. And you can even include your CRM. You can include prop stream or whatever that is. Like, it doesn't matter. You're okay. just going to try to g- gather what your expenses are. And mm-hmm. then once you get your first deal and you make your first deal, you now divide that and you can very quickly identify your expenses to your income or your revenue and identify your ROI. And that's the most basic rudimentary way to go about this to know, hey, I just spent $1,000 and I just made a $30,000 deal. That means that you just made a 30X return on that $1,000. Now, stupid people will then go spend that and buy a watch or Something like that. And by the way, I'm making a joke. Evan bought a watch. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, stupid people will will buy something with that money because they feel that they reward themselves with that. But smart people identify that they can only spend so little on themselves, but the rest needs to be reinvested back in the business so they can now make that thousand dollars a month go to five. That yep. five go to 20, that 20 go to 50. The biggest players in the nation are spending between 50 to $100,000 a month on marketing spend. Okay. I'm slightly below that and I'm trying to get there. Okay. So keep going. Sorry, I, I know I interrupted you, but. No, no, that was perfect. Because that that was my original question is is just from the beginning, what am I tracking? And that's perf- That's a perfect way to do it. So I'm going to be doing that. And then uh, talk, can you talk to us about general sales since you come from a scale- sales background? I myself am from healthcare. Uh, sounds like you, I'm a physical therapist uh, by trade, transitioning out of that, but a lot of uh, trauma. So I feel like I've, I'm not I don't have for- formal sales training, but I, on a daily basis, used to have to okay. convince people what? that were in pain and about to throw up that this is what's going to happen, but you still got to get out of bed. So how do I transition those skills into? Uh, so right now, Heidi, God, I love you. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me explain this to you for a second. You're a physical therapist. I spent a lot of time with people like you during my injury. Okay. Right. And yeah. if you just tell me, Jeremy, do this workout. I'm going to say, no, fuck you. You're going to say, well, I was going to say it would be much worse than no. (laughs) No, it hurts. It hurts. I don't want to do it. It hurts. Okay. It hurts. Repeat that. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts. Because people that are trying to sell their property are experiencing pain. So what do you do, Heidi, when you have a client or you have a patient that's there in front of you and they say, no, it hurts. How do you convince them to do that exercise? It depends on the person. <laughs> sure, of course it does. It does. But yeah, it, it, mostly it's just kind of meeting them where they are, finding out what is their pain point and what's going to motivate them. That's all it is. Once you can get there, then the rest is. And they got to trust you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you got to do one success. And then the ne- you, you do two two minutes one day. And then you come back the next day, you do three. And, and in this circumstance, what you do, do you think that you would be able to get a patient to do one exercise, one exercise, 
if you promise them that if they listen to you, that you will cure their pain? Uh, yes, absolutely. Okay. Let me give you an example of one deal. Um, we door knock and we leave a note on the, on the door and the seller calls and he goes, um, I, I think he owed taxes. I think he owed like $8,000 in taxes. And uh, he calls me and he goes, Hey, I, I'm not looking to sell my house. I just need to borrow $8,000. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm not in the game to, to lend money, but I am in the market to buy houses. And I know you said you don't want to, but what would it take for you to sell your house? And he goes, $400,000. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't buy your house for $400,000. It's literally the ARV is $400,000. Um, but if you can come down on your price, I'll drive to your house right now. I'll inspect it and I'll make you an offer. And he goes, okay, fine, 300,000. So he drops by $100,000 by me asking that question. I drive to his house, I walk the property and I say to him, why do you wanna sell? And he goes, to be honest with you, I've got really bad roommates. Um, they're drug users. And all I wanna do is buy a mobile home or a motor home and I wanna travel the nation and I, I, I'm i about to get my social security in my retirement. I wanna travel the nation, I wanna golf and I wanna fish. And I said, really? Have you been looking at uh, motorhomes yet? And he goes, yes, I've got my eye on one. It's about $75,000. And I said, if I can get you that motorhome in one week, would you sell your house to me today? And he goes, I would. What does that mean? I go, let's do 225 and I'll buy, I'll get that motorhome for you in one week. And so in one week, he had the money in his pocket. He literally, I am not joking you. He literally didn't even tell the roommates that <laughs> when he was selling the house. He just uh -huh. left. And you know what he did in in, uh, in return? He was a woodworker. He was a carpenter. And he knew that my wife was pregnant. And he actually, in that week, he made a baby rocking chair for us. He left that baby rocking chair with a note saying, thank you so much, Jeremy. I appreciate you. And he went off into the sunset. I have no idea where he is today. I got the sheriffs involved. We got those guys evicted and moved out. And then that was a great deal that made $75,000. Gosh, isn't that amazing? You can, you can solve his problem. He's happy. You're happy. Exactly. So, All of the things, so, yeah. so Heidi, to, to reflect on your question, you literally cure people's pain every day. And while they are experiencing pain currently, and while they're experiencing pain during your exercises, you are literally helping them remove that pain from their life. And so the same thing applies to, you don't have to be a salesperson. I know that I speak well, but I also know there's a lot of people that barely speak English that can still make deals happen because they identify, like Mark just said, locate and find the bunnies. That's a Pace Morby analogy, basically, Find the bunnies means find the reason that that person needs to sell their property, fix their problem, and they will go with you. And so for you, I could already tell you've got a huge heart. I could already tell you want to help people. You're not in this for the money. Sure, I know we say that, but you ideally care about people. You have a lot of empathy and you want to help them. And so as long as you let that shine, you are going to do very well in this business. Just make sure of one thing. Don't let people step on you. That's the one, one problem is that we want to help people and vultures and users and bad, bad souls will feed off that and take advantage of you and just literally sell to the next person after you've solved all their problems and just go right behind your back and sell. Yeah, I at least I have some years on me. I have a year, few years on few of you. So <laughs> that I have learned over time. But thank you so much for the advice. You are very welcome. I will take it to heart. Well, you know, Jeremy, I, I had a couple of questions for you. Yeah. Now, when we talk about, you know, the sales aspect and and um, is this exclusively relating to wholesaling? Does this have, apply to all aspects of real estate? Well, well, no. I mean, it actually doesn't apply to any real estate. It applies to marketing. And it's not wholesaling. It's marketing. It's it's if you are selling um, tamales, you know that you need to reach this many people that will be interested in buying a tamale 
and you know how much money you have to spend on the materials, on the corn, on the beef, on the pork, whatever it is, you know this that this cost is going to be returned X fold. So whatever it is, it's sales and marketing. It's not wholesaling. It's not real estate. It's marketing. And okay. that is what this business is. It's the same thing for being a real estate agent. Um, you know, God help you, Claudia. But you know that if you spend X number of dollars going on Zillow to let them use you as like a partner agent or whatever that is, where you buy Zillow leads, you know that if you spend a thousand dollars on Zillow leads that you're going to get X number of leads and you might lock up a few of them. You know that because it's just sales and marketing. It applies to the world of sales and marketing, not real estate. So as I said, sub two teaches you all about real estate, but nothing about marketing. And that's what I'm here for. That's awesome. Now you've dropped some unbelievable gold nuggets today. I know people are taking notes there along the way. I saw some folks. Um, I definitely took down the website. He left as well as the, the text number. I'll be reaching out to you. Um, I just want to say thank you, brother. Thank you for coming yeah. on. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Uh, you know, that's all I'm trying to do is bring people, you know, to the platform that can share and, and that know stuff. And so hopefully not only my group can benefit, but people on YouTube that watch and later on can benefit as well. Um, yeah. again, I, 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 I want to show you something right now, right here, two minutes ago, I just got a lead that came in that cost us probably about $500. So right now, what I should be saying is, hey, I'm going to let you go so that I can call this lead and lock it up. But uh, Evan, would you be up? Uh, guys, before we go, um, Evan, my COO, my integrator, my implementer, do you guys have any integrator questions for him? Let's, real quick? Let, you know, let's bring him on and introduce him. Hang on a second here. Let me let me slide him on in here. Evan, hey. welcome to the call, my friend. How are you? Hey, JJ, I'm good. Um, uh, for those that don't know, you you want to give us a little bit of background on yourself, maybe how you met Jeremy or what you've been doing in real estate prior to meeting him? Yeah, sure. So I'll give you a quick, uh, try to do it in less than a minute. So I grew up in California. Uh, I was in the Army. I was in the Army for four years. Uh, came out to Utah, went to the Huntsman School of Business for Finance and Economics. Uh, did some middle market investment banking in predominantly healthcare. Um, but I did do a hundred million in real estate while I was with them. And then, uh, did, was at a student led venture capital fund here in Salt Lake city called university growth fund. Um, I was a police officer for a year for Cottonwood Heights here in Utah. I come from a family of law enforcement, um, and military. And so serving is a big part of my life is where Jeremy and I connected with him being uh, a medic and, um, I actually was listening to the bigger pockets podcast and, uh, and pace Morby and Jamil Damji and all these, uh, all these guys in the space while I was in my patrol vehicle and wasn't feeling very fulfilled because I had, um, all this, uh, financial experience and, and education under my belt. And, um, so you're yeah, a patrol vehicle. Yeah, I was sitting in a patrol vehicle and I loved getting in chases. I loved serving warrants. I loved doing all that stuff, but I felt like um, I just wasn't living to my highest potential. And so I was listening to podcasts, uh, came across Dean Rogers, again, Pace Morby, um, Jamil Damji, all these guys, and um, ended up joining Sub2 found out about Jeremy's create the creative finance meetup, largest meetup, uh, investor meetup here in Utah, went there. Um, and I just started door knocking. So on my days off, um, from patrolling, I was patrolling nights. So I was working nights and then I'd get up, uh, I'd sleep a little bit and then I would go door knock houses and, uh, pre foreclosures, notice the defaults. And so I was doing that and I found a lead and I took it to Jeremy. And this is what I say to everybody is, you know, find somebody in the space that's doing deals. If you haven't done your first deal, go find a deal and then just go bring them that deal. Because um, by doing that, Jeremy got to know who, you know, who I am. Um, we didn't even close the deal. Like it wasn't even that great of a deal. Like there was there was some motivation there. But at the time, it was just somebody saying potentially yes. And that was so exciting to me 
that I brought it to, I brought it to Jeremy and, um, that led to me joining his door knocking team, door knocking a, a bunch of houses with him, jumping into an acquisition seat. And then once he re once he found out that I had done, you know, um, a couple of years and while I was doing my undergrad in investment banking and then in, um, in venture capital, private equity, he was like, okay, well, what Yeah. can you, can you do this? Can you do that? And we just, you know, we talked about all aspects of the business, you know, went through, okay, what's happening in marketing, what's happening in acquisitions, what's happening in operations, what's happening in your admin department, what's happening, um, in, in finance, how are you tracking everything? What are your systems look like? What are your KPIs? You know, all that stuff, the, um, the, the sheet, the model, the, the, you know, model income statement that Jeremy had went through, uh, just, just gone through. I built that and then all the, the KPIs and stuff. And so, um, I think the moment was Jeremy realized I knew how to run Excel. And I think that, Oh, that's all I needed. <laughs> That's all I needed. I think I, I that think was. what's really important, I, I want to interrupt something real quick, Evan. Um, guys, I know I was talking about don't hire sub two students, and I'm literally showing you a sub two student that I hired. Um, Evan is not um he he's not immune from wanting to do his own thing. I'm just identifying for him milestones that I want to get hit to where once those milestones are hit, then equity becomes his thing. And so what I mean by that is once I already know my baseline vitals. I already know the numbers I need to hit. And once he has excelled those numbers and those milestones have been hit by him, then equity will be earned. So just so you guys understand, like I'm not hiring somebody that I don't expect. Like if I didn't give, if I didn't show Evan the goal and the promise of equity in this, he wouldn't have the drive or the heart to continue. He's not an hourly employee. That's why he joined sub two. And so it's again, guys, it's identifying what somebody's looking for. And for me, I have no problem giving away equity to a business if that means that I get to walk away from that business while that business still makes me money. And that's Evan right there. Yeah, it's all about setting like healthy, healthy milestones and like what you want to do in the business. You know, like when you're when you first partner up with somebody, you kind of have to think like, you know, is this somebody that's that's going to be here for the the long term? And if that's the case, so I just right up front, give them half the equity of my company. Like for Jeremy, that didn't make sense. You know, he already had an established brand. He had an established company for a lot of you guys on here. who are, who have already done deals like Graham, you've already done deals. You're not just going to bring somebody in and give them 50% of your company, you know? So there's gotta be milestones. There's gotta be, you know, certain things that you want hit certain, um, you know, goals that you have that need to need to be hit. And so, um, yeah, it, it makes sense for everybody from the very beginning to be growth oriented, um, you know, and, and make sure that you're, you're hitting those goals and that you're bringing on the right people that can hit those goals. Yeah. Cause What have, they'll, Evan, what have you been doing the past few days? uh, so I've been hiring, um, we're hiring on another follow-up specialist. Uh, I've been doing 15 minute quick phone interviews back to back to back to back. How many applicants? Uh, 135. Wow. So, so Evan, for the past couple of days, has been interviewing 135 applicants. Out of those 135, how many of them do you think were qualified? Uh, it's about 20. Yeah. So um, I'm sure he's been pulling out his hair. Um, but again, that's what the COO, that's what the implementer is supposed to be there for. So he's doing the first round and then I come in for the second round. And then that person is essentially going to be hired under me, under my department. I'm going to train them up in sales, get them to where if they can be 85% as good as me, I'm okay with that. But we still have our baseline vitals to know what our KPIs need to be. And as long as those people that we hire hit those KPIs, we're smooth sailing. Now, are these necessarily people that are in Utah? Only Utah. We're only hiring. Local. Um, as I mentioned to you, uh, we're very soon going to be getting into an office space. That's something that's been lagging a little bit. We we're trying to find the best of both worlds. One, we do a meetup every month, and it's it's getting bigger and bigger every month. So we've outgrown a, some some of our event spaces. So we're trying to find like a flex industrial space that can house the events, um, our podcasts, uh, you know, speaker events, as well as our office. So, um, so yeah, what we're doing though, is we're going to be having Utah people only. We ideally are going to be having a sales floor. We're going to be having, you know, the people in the pit, you guys have seen Wolf of Wall Street. That's us. Cool. So, Cool. there you go.
Well, guys, I, I want to thank you. You guys have really brought on a lot of value today. Uh, Evan, thank you so much for, for coming on and joining us and letting us introduce you. Um, I've sent you a message on uh, social media. Hopefully, you and I can connect at a later time and, and get better acquainted. Yeah, thanks, JJ. It was great meeting you, and thanks for having me on. Thank you for thank you for joining us today. No, I was going to say one more time for anybody that's on uh, YouTube watching this, if you guys want to text us, 385-488-2889, if you want any information, or if you want to text us your name and your email, we'll send you that whole spreadsheet thing that we just showed you guys on the Zoom. Sounds great. Hey, again, I really want to thank you for coming on. I know how busy you are. I sincerely appreciate you. Um, I got two last questions before we end the recording part of the call. One, if people want to reach out to you, you kind of just covered that. The best way would be to text you via the phone number you just gave us. Yep. Text that number, um, 385-488-2889. Or you can follow me on Instagram at the Jeremy Davis or the Jeremy Davis if you're not a refined individual. My last question to you. I've got a networking group and I talk about the importance of that all the time. Um, sub two, there's many communities out there that have an educational program and they have people coming every day as new members of the community. Some are brand spanking new to real estate. Some are very experienced with, with years, if not decades of experience. But quite frequently, these people are coming to social media, Facebook, never having used social media as a business tool. Networking is a business tool via social media. Sure. What is the importance of networking to the success of any real estate investor's business, whether inexperienced or experienced? And what's the importance of possibly joining a group like mine? Okay. Uh, very simple answer. Uh, your social media is your business card of 2024. Um, I literally, Katie, my wife, she's like, Jeremy, uh, what do you want me to do with these business cards? And I was like, oh, just throw them away. Like a business card is is useless to me now. I don't even know who this is. I don't even know. Um, but uh, it, it's all about, it's your, it's your digital business card. And this thing right here, for example, this, if someone puts their phone on this, it gives them all of my social media as well. So that if I meet someone in person, boom, they just scan that and there you go. Um, social media is extremely important for number one, to show people your credibility, to show people like when I'm borrowing money, I'll give you a great example. I borrowed $500,000 from someone who I had no idea who they were that saw one of my stories on Instagram where I literally showed a lock on a fence of one of our flips that was stuck. And I'm like, what do you think, guys? Should I cut this off? And that was my story. And he messaged me on that store and he goes, hey, man, I see your stuff. I'm looking again to real estate. I've got about $500,000 to lend. Can we work together? Absolutely. I'd love to. So he's one of my private money lenders that I'm making money on his money while he gets to connect with me. He gets to be in my proximity. And he may not have been a high performer in real estate, but because he brought something to the table, my social media allowed him to identify who I was. And it was my credibility package. It was my, my business card. So number one, it's all about your credibility and showing the, the public what you're doing so they can see who you are, that they can trust you as an individual. And then number two, networking is networking, man. When Evan goes to me and goes, hey, Jeremy, we need... Uh, a plumber that specializes in skyscrapers. I don't know a plumber that specializes in skyscrapers, but I have a very large network of friends and I'm going to literally post that question and someone's going to reach out to me to say, we recommend Jose, you know? And so, um, so that's what networking on social media does for you as well is it allows you to be a connector or to have things connected to you so that you can speed and move it. I, I'll even say this social media is like the oil in the gears of a business. That when Evan has a problem or, or something needs to be fixed, because of social media and because of the network, the large circle of people around me, I have the ability to find an answer to a problem or a solution to a problem almost instantly so that we can move forward and keep pushing forward. Otherwise, what are you gonna do? Pull up the Encyclopedia Britannica and try to figure out a solution? Like. No, and I just dated myself. All you millennials have no idea what Encyclopedia Britannica is. No, um, not at all. Yeah, so so there you go. I think that that answers your question, JJ. Yeah, thank you so much. Hey, if you guys are watching on YouTube right now, please like Jeremy's video. Click the little like button on the comment section. Please put your takeaways, what you found valuable. 
um, how you think we can improve with what we're providing for you here on YouTube. Uh, again, if you want to connect with Jeremy, it's going to be via his Instagram or the web, the phone number that he gave you earlier. If you want to connect with me, you could scan the QR code right to my right next to me here. It's the uh, to register for my group, and of course, in this corner up here is my website address and my Instagram. Um, if you guys are on the call right now, don't go away. We're going to go to breakout rooms. And um, if you've been on the call, if you're watching on YouTube, thank you guys so much for joining us. We really, really appreciate you. And Jeremy, we'll see all of them out there in the uh, virtual network land of Instagram and uh, Facebook, right? Love it. Yeah, love it, guys. Thank you so much for uh, being here for my rants and my raves. And uh, I really hope that I added some value to you guys. And JJ, thank you very much for having me on. You were awesome, bro. Thank you so much. Everybody else, see you guys later. Thank you for joining us.